Welcome, welcome. My name is Marissa. I am a museum educator at the Lacey Museum. A quick show of hands, who's been to Lacey Museum before? Great, most of you. Uh, so for those who have not, uh, our current hours were Thursdays and Fridays 11 to 3 and Saturdays from 10 to 4. And this is our last week uh, for our Sasquatch Revealed exhibit. So our last day of that will be uh, the 28th, so this Saturday. Uh, that's just been an absolute blast. So if you haven't had a chance to see it, please come down. We'd absolutely love to have you. Uh, we are still free, always free. So please come and visit us. A uh, few things of note before we get started here. Uh, we do have our bus tour here. We have a uh, fully full fully filled that bus tour for October 13th, but we do have a wait list going. So if you're interested in going on that bus tour, but just didn't get the chance to sign up, you can call our Parks and Recreation Department and they'll get you signed up for that wait list. Our next speaker will be John Dodge. So that will be Saturday, October 12th. So it is a Saturday at 1.30. Uh, John Dodge is a local author and he'll talk about the 1962 Columbus Day storm. He wrote a book on that recently. He'll have some books. Uh, speaking of books, uh, we do have some books here today that our lovely speaker will be selling. So the book pictured right up there, uh, they will be $20. So if you could after, please show your support, go buy those books. I'm sure you can get them signed if you ask nicely. All right, and on to the show. Dennis Larson is a retired high school history teacher. He told me he taught at Yelm. He is a member of the Oregon California Trails Association, the Puyallup Historical Society at the Meeker Mansion, and the Tumwater Historical Association. For the last 20 years, he has been researching and writing about Northwest pioneers. Dennis is the author and co-author of six books and numerous historical articles. He has lectured in venues across the country from Washington to Maine. He has written four books on Ezra Meeker, the subject of today's topic. Please welcome Dennis Larson. And oops, there. Uh, it was Alan who's the topic today. I, sh I gave you the wrong thing. Okay. Um, we're going to go back in time today to 1852, 1853, 1854. Give you a setting. Um, I wrote these books with a partner, and her name is Karen Johnson. And she's the curator at the Schmidt House, and she is going to be doing a talk here in a couple weeks, well, a couple months, I guess, about the College Trail. And if you don't know where the Schmidt House is, it's over by the uh, old Tumwater Brewery, the Olympia Brewery, over in that neighborhood. Okay. Um, today I'm going to tell you the story about the building of the Natchez Pass Wagon Road and of the Longmire Biles Wagon Train, the first to come over that road. And that story has become almost legendary in the history of territorial Washington. And over the last few years, Karen and I have been privileged to research the story of this guy up there, Edward J. Allen, the man who actually built that road. And in the process, we've learned that a lot of things that we thought were fact that are in the history books are indeed not factual. They're wrong. And we'll go over a few of those today. Prior to our discovery of the Allen family documents, all that existed of Allen's writing was a brief 1853 letter in the Olympia newspaper and a short passage in the 1913 edition of Theodore Winthrop's Canoe and Saddle. Thus, history has heard virtually nothing from the man in charge of building the road. Today, I'm going to tell the story of Natchez Pass, fact versus legend. But first, a quiz. These are the Cross Cascade Highways. Highway 20, as we know it, is the North Cascades Highway. What mountain pass does it go over? Washington and Rainey. Hey, Washington and Rainey, correct. US 2? Stevens. Stevens. I-90? Snoqualmie. Snoqualmie. Let's go to the bottom. US 12? White, White Pass. And 410? Chinook Pass, correct. And then there's this thing in the middle, State Highway 168. Anybody recognize it? It's Natchez Pass. It was designated a state highway way back in the early 1900s. 
Now, I don't have time in this talk to tell you the whole story of why it is not a state highway today, but at the end of the, of the talk, somebody asked me, and I'll give you a brief description. Okay, in 1853, which of these mountain passes would you go over if you were in a covered wagon? Natchez. Not any of the ones we're using now. Oops, wrong way. No. Okay, let's tell you a little about Alan. He was 22 years old when he came west. He came from Pittsburgh, and he came basically for three reasons. He was told by his doctors that he had a severe case of bronchitis. He was coughing up blood constantly, and they told him you needed to get out of smoky Pittsburgh. The solution was go west over the Oregon Trail and eat dust for about four or five months. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> the second reason he came west was he had a, a case of Oregon fever. Actually, in his case, it was California fever. Everybody that he knew, all his friends and everything, they were all heading toward the West Coast. And he was really wanting to do that. And a guy named Quincy Brooks, who lived out here a year before Alan came west, who was a Pittsburgh native and an old schoolmate, had written some letters back home saying, don't go to California, you know, go to Washington, which wasn't called Washington then, it was called Oregon. And so the last reason, he was in a dead-end job, and he was looking for some adventure. He found it. He came west with uh, four guys, four young men, sharing a wagon. Uh, Jacob Reeser was on the left here, and he was sort of a distant cousin. A guy named McClure and, uh, and Carnahan also traveled with them. The four guys shared the expenses and everything. These two kept journals, Reeser and Allen. Allen's journal's over there on the right, and it's at the University of Pittsburgh. This is his family, and as he traveled west, he wrote letters to these people. And we are indebted to this guy over here because he saved all those letters. That was Allen's brother. Now, these are his parents, and this is his brother, William who actually is going to become a property owner here in Thurston County, even though he lived in Pittsburgh in 1853. And this is his sisters, Amelia, Rebecca, and Elizabeth. And there was another brother uh, named George who died young. Now, what the brother did with those letters was he transcribed them, took out all the personal stuff, the family's things, and sent them to the local newspaper who published them and he went out like you know any good brother would do and bought 40 copies of the newspaper and put them all in a scrapbook and he gave each one of his siblings and his parents a scrapbook. Two of those scrapbooks have survived and that's another source that we have used to help write our books. Now, he, Alan arrived in Olympia in December of 1862 and he came up what was called the Cowlitz Trail, which was kind of a mud-filled mess, and Karen Johnson will tell you all about that down the road. He took out a donation land claim on Cooper's Point. Uh, here's Bud Inlet, and here's Eld Inlet, and that's where he took his land claim. And this is from uh, the beach over here by Priest Point Park, and if you look right back in there, there's a little cove, I think it's called Tickle Cove, and that's where he built his cabin. And he, to get to Olympia, to get his mail and supplies and foods, he had to canoe down three miles from his cabin down to where the capital is today. Now in 1853, when he actually kind of got settled here, there were only three routes that made sense to come to Puget Sound. Most of the immigrants would arrive down here in the Portland area in October, early October usually. And then they would pause and regroup and figure out what are we gonna do next? Well, lots of them went down south into the Willamette Valley and settled, but a lot of them wanted to come up to Puget Sound. The problem was there was no easy way to get here. The Cowlitz Trail was a sea of mud and swamps. And in November, when they actually started up that trail, what does it do here in November? <laughs> well, you know, that, most of the smart people waited until spring until things dried out a little bit and stayed down in the Portland area until then. Or you could take a boat, 
and go around like this in November. <laughs> now, you know, there's not any navigation aids in those days at the bar, at the Columbia River Bar, and being out in the open ocean isn't such a great idea for November. But this is how the folks who started Seattle came. They came around like that. The third route was sort of unknown. It was the Natchez Pass Trail. And it was a pack road. It wasn't a wagon road, it was a pack road. But it had a distinct advantage. If you went this way, you ended up right in Puget Sound at the end of September, early October. And you beat everybody else who went this way and had to wait for spring to go up that way. So the question was, could this be made into a wagon road? There was a guy named uh, Mike Simmons who lived here. Some of you probably have seen the name. He thought it maybe was possible to turn that trail into a wagon road. And so what he did was he went out up in the Buckley Enumclaw area and started making it. Uh, he got about eight miles constructed and he said, it's just too difficult, he gave up. But if the trail through Puget Sound is gone. I mean, there's no remnants of it anywhere in the lowlands of Puget Sound. But if you know where to look, there are indicators to tell you where it was. This is Connell's Prairie, and this is Enumclaw's right over there, and Buckley's kind of where I'm standing, if you want to know where you're at. This is uh, the marker for Connell's Prairie, and it tells you all about it. And up there, as you go through Bonnie Lake, they do that. They put up a neat little signs and tell you, yeah, this is where the Natchez Trail went. And when you get to Puyallup, where they forded the Puyallup River, they even have a sign to tell you where the ford was. And it was right here. It's where they crossed the Puyallup River. And as you go across the south hill of Puyallup, they have all kinds of these little maps posted with little symbols and stuff to tell you that you are here. And you can figure out where the trail went, although you know it's all houses and urban development. But if you go to Rogers High School and you walk out on the grounds there, you'll see this embedded in the ground to tell you that Natchez Pass went right through the campus. The Natchez Trail, I mean, went right through the campus. And in Fredericksburg, there's a little pocket park to tell you about it. And when you get to Spanaway, there's a stone marker here that says Camp Montgomery used to be here. And over on the other side of Spanaway by the golf course, there's another one of these markers right where you cross Fort uh, McCord Air Force Base. And it tells you about the road. And then the neatest marker is the one that marks the, the last camp for the Longmire Biles wagon train, which was the first wagon train to come over the trail in 1853. And it's embedded with this bronze medallion and it's got a covered wagon with a woman and baby there and a man walking in front going toward the setting sun. This is Ezra Meeker, his wife, and his infant son. And this is the logo of the organization that Ezra Meeker started to save the Oregon Trail in, 1820, in 1926. This is at Brookdale Golf Course, which is now going to become a housing development, I understand. And then if you just go down I-5 and you go by Ponder's Corner and you look over to the west, you'll see this one. And then if you finally get to the end of the trail at Fort Stellicum, there's another one. And then some of the buildings that date from that time period are still standing out there at the fort. Okay, 1853, Washington Territory was formed. We split off from Oregon, we became our own territory and they took a census. Oops, backtrack hit the wrong thing. That's how many non-natives, you know, non-native Americans were living here in Washington Territory in 1853. Thurston County and Pierce County had 1,500 people between them. They kind of thought they needed some more people here. <laughs> now, you know, you kind of wish that they'd slowed the gates down a little bit, you know, the floodgates, but they didn't. Okay. And along with making us a territory, Congress appropriated $20,000 to build a road from Fort Stellicum to Fort Walla Walla. Now, 
Stellicum is right just outside, the fort is right outside the city. And Walla Walla, the fort was down here but where the Walla Walla River came into the Columbia. It's not where the city was. So this was where they were going to build the military road and the wagon road. And it was supposed to go over the Cascade Mountains somewhere. Jefferson Davis, the guy who was president of the Confederacy in 1853, he was the Secretary of War. And he sent three exploring parties out west looking for a transcontinental railroad route. Isaac Stevens, who became our first territorial governor, was put in charge of the northern route. Now, Stevens started in St. Paul and made his way west. And he knew that by the time he got to the Cascades, it was going to be November. And he wanted those thoroughly explored before he got there. So he needed a partner to go west ahead of him. And that partner was this guy, George McClellan, Union commander during the Civil War, ran against Abe Lincoln for president. Well, Jefferson Davis gave McClellan some specific orders. He said, you're going to go west. You're going to go down to the Isthmus of Panama and make your way up to Vancouver Barracks. And you are going to explore the Cascade Mountains. And you're going to find Natchez Pass. And you're going to build a wagon road. And if it turns out that you can't get the whole road built this year, you are then going to build a road over the hardest parts. And you're going to leave somebody there to guide the incoming wagon trains over your road. And you are under Governor Stevens's command. He's the boss. We'll see how well McClellan obeys those orders. <laughs> so the road viewers, uh, we'd call it a survey party today. Back in those days, they called them road viewers. And they went out to see if Natchez Pack Trail could be turned into a wagon road. And they held a meeting in Olympia, a mass meeting that day. And everybody kind of talked about the possibilities and all that. And Alan was there at the meeting, and he had a book from Father Blanchett. And the, the Catholic minister, uh, missionaries had gone back and forth over Natchez Trail a lot. And so Blanchett was one of these guys that was familiar with it. And Alan read a little passage from that. And at the end of the meeting, they appointed four guys to go out and actually look at it and see if it could be turned into a wagon road. And those four guys were Alan, right here, and a guy named uh, Shazer, George Shazer, whose grave is in Pioneer Cemetery in Lacey. And he was from uh, 1840s, he came here with the American Fur Company. Uh, John Edgar, who was working for the Hudson's Bay Company, and Whitfield Kirtley, who was a uh, school board director for the Olympia School District. They also had a bunch of Native Americans as guides because these guys didn't have a clue as to where they were going. <laughs> this is where they went. Um, they started in Olympia, and they went across the uh, Nisqually River right here, and they picked up Edgar, who lived here, made their way across the Puyallup River to the White River, followed the White River up to the Greenwater River, then turned and followed it up into the mountains and then up to Natchez Pass. And then they worked their way down the east side and they popped out, you know where Whistling Jack's Lodge is over by Chinook Pass? In that area is where they popped out. This is what the Puyallup River looked like back in those days before it was diked. And as you can see, uh, when they got into the bottomlands by the rivers, horseback travel was a little tough. But they got to the White River, and they managed to get across it and followed the Greenwater River up into the mountains. And then they hit snow. And when they got up to the top, they found everything covered in snow and a whole series of meadows up there. And the biggest meadow was called Government Meadow, and it probably looked like this when they arrived. The difference was it was raining. It wasn't sunshiny. So they camped that night under a tree, got wet, and in the morning they found that the snow had frozen hard enough so the horses could go across it without sinking. And so they started east down the hill. Alan had this comp ooh, backtrack. I hit the wrong thing. Alan had this compass with him, 
which is kind of neat. I actually got to hold that in my hand once. And he uh, looked at it and said, we're going south. That's the wrong way. They stopped their Native American guides, and they confessed that they were lost. And so Alan said, well, let's just follow the compass. And so they followed it east, down to this river, and then eventually to the Big Natchez River. And they followed it past what is today called Edgar Rock. And they broke out into the open country. And when they broke out into the open country, they decided that they would send Allen and Shazer back to Olympia so that um, you know, they could tell everybody, let's start getting ourselves organized for building this road. And uh, Kurtley and Edgar came back and blazed the route kind of slow. Now, Allen was kind of verbal in his letters. This is how he describes his arrival in Olympia. At the outskirts of Olympia, we met a party of ladies and gentlemen going out to Judge Yannis's. We dashed through them, scarce reining up to tell them the road could be made, hurried on to the sound of their cheers following on our heels. And we pitched into Olympia, almost to the other end where we had to go ere we could check our excited horses. Such a commotion on our arrival kicked up in that extensive place. We immediately delivered a brief report to the committee. It would not have taken but five minutes to go from one end of Olympia to the other in 1853. Um, this report was published in the Olympia newspaper, and until now, it was the only available description of that scouting expedition. But now we have all sorts of information. So they got to build a road. They turned to the local merchants. The merchants in Stellicum supplied them with uh, road builders with equipment and everything at cost. Uh, Dr. Tolmy of the Hudson's Bay Company supplied them with beef cattle at $5 a head. And these guys were put in charge of two important jobs. Uh, Andy Birch over there on the right was the packer. He's the guy who brought all the food and all the supplies up to the workers. He traveled that road back and forth all summer. The guy on the left is Andrew Moore, and he was the money man. He was in charge of finances. So pay attention to him because he becomes important, and so does Andy. There are a couple places where the trail still exists, and this is in Federation Forest State Park just out west of Greenwater, and there's a little remnant of the trail still there. But when they got up into the forests, Remember, this is old growth forest. And when the trees fall down, that's trouble. And those trees caused even bigger trouble. They definitely couldn't do this. It would have taken way too long. So what they did, when a log was laying down, a tree was laying down, they went around it, if they could. And so the trail would look like a snake as it wound its way through the forest. If they couldn't go around it, they would build a ramp to go up over and down the other side, and occasionally they would build a tunnel underneath. But they didn't want to do that either, because that was time consuming. The one hazard that they didn't really think about was this guy. Um, they found out that the woods were full of these things, and it required somebody going out ahead of time and burning the nests. And the guy on the right, this is an older uh, Robert Moore, he was a young man when he did this, he was assigned the job of burning out the hornet's nests. And it was done with a 20-foot pole with a torch in the end. But Moore found that kind of boring. So he cut the pole down to 10 feet. And then he cut it to 5 feet. And here's what Alan said happened. Continued warnings did not affect his ardent desire to decide the matter. While the indignation of the hornets was growing stronger than their surprise, and it culminated in a vicious attack from the special nest he was destroying, in which all the homeless hornets, which had previously been the object of his attention, seemed to take part. His long hair was filled with them. All the bare places were covered with their legions, and from far and near they came through the air like bullets, striking the man with an absolute impact, who became frantic and tore through the woods, regardless of direction, knocking against nests and calling out new enemies every minute. He was blind and deaf, but not all dumb. 
He had frantically torn off all his clothing as he ran in a desperate endeavor to rid himself of the insects that had penetrated every inch of those clothes. And entirely naked, he had halted despairingly on a creek bank, standing over a bee's nest in the ground with a hornet's nest overhead. Unquestionably, he would have been killed there. But gathering together heavy bunches of brush, several of us, and not without many bitter stings, rushed in and pushed him over the bank into a deep pool, and then falling flat on the ground, lay quiet until the excitement had somewhat subsided. But submitting to a few stings from some of these enemies who did not fully expect the usages of warfare, we crawled slowly away. Now, of all the hazards of building a road, this was not one you would expect. More recovered, but it took him a while. He was out of action for a long time. Okay, let's go back to old Mr. McClellan, the guy that Abe Lincoln hired to be the Union commander. And if you know your history, Abe had a nickname for him. He said he has a case of the slows. Uh, McClellan had, could not attack unless absolutely everything was totally perfect and everything was never perfect. And Abe got pretty frustrated with him and eventually fired him. Well, if he would have paid attention to McClellan's activities here in 1853, he would have never hired him. <laughs> okay, so McClellan came west and came to Vancouver Barracks, which was down here, and it took him forever to get started. Uh, the first day he went three miles and he forgot something and he sent everybody back to get it. And then the next day they started again and he went about five miles and he forgot something and they went back. And the third day, the same thing. And eventually he got going, and he came up here, and he left his outfit here, his, and he went up to Natchez Pass, spent the night, looked around, came back, and then took off. What were his orders? Build a road. Yeah, well, you know, he went up here to Ellensburg, to that area, and went up and explored Snoqualmie Pass, came back here, and a piece of luck happened to walk into his camp. Andrew Moore, the money man, had tracked McClellan down because he'd heard that he was up there in the mountains. And McClellan looked at Moore and he says, Allen and guys are building a road. I'm going to put them on government contract. Then I don't have to build it. And so right at that point, Allen's workers were put on government contract. And McClellan just continued on his merry way up here and explored up toward the North Cascades. And eventually he met Governor Stevens up here by Colville. Now, Governor Stevens had heard about the Longmire wagon train and said, you know, get yourself down here to Natchez Pass and build that road. McClellan came up with every excuse you could imagine not to do that. And to the point where the barometers that were supposed to measure the elevation of the pass magically got broken. And Stevens finally got frustrated and he just went down this way and made his way to Olympia where he took over as governor. McClellan tagged along behind slowly this way, and he arrived in Olympia also without ever setting foot on any kind of road building project or leaving a guide or anything that he was supposed to do. Now, for a brief time that summer, Natchez Pass was really a busy place. There was all kinds of back and forth traffic. The east side road workers were an army troops and Packers were bringing supplies and pack animals over the pass. Uh, Army dispatch riders were going back and forth. And even an odd tourist like Theodore Winthrop here, he showed up with his Indian guide. And on August 26th, Winthrop going east encountered Lieutenant Hodges and his men going west. And Hodges had just passed through Allen's camp where he stopped briefly to exchange news. And he continued on and he arrived in Allen's camp that night and he stayed there for the next day. And his description of that camp in Canoe and Saddle, the 1913 edition, is the only other thing we had about the road builders until we found Allen's papers. And this marker right here is at Greenwater, and it's where Allen's camp was, where the road workers' camp was. So let's look at the route as it goes through the mountains. Okay. He's, that road back there is the trail, and it went back through the trees like this. This is on the east side. We're coming from the east. And then up there at the top in those trees is this sign that says Natchez Pass, but it's in the wrong place. 
I'm actually standing closer to Natchez Pass. And there is a survey marker there that tells you this is Natchez Pass, and it is the only place in Washington where four counties touch. And you can see we have four feet there, one of us standing in each county. Who can name the four? It's out loud. Okay, Pierce and King. Yakima. Kittitas. Yeah, it's the only place in the state where the four counties touch. Now, the trail did not go through government meadows. This was too wet. The trail went through the trees over here. And so they're coming from this way and they're skirting along the trees here through government meadows. And then when they get over in this direction, there are a series of small prairies that are kind of neat like this with a neat view of Mount Rainier. And then the trail went along this ridge down like this and then along this ridge, and then down this steep section, down to the Greenwater River, and then out the Greenwater River to the White River and out to Enumclaw. Now, in 1854, it was a little tough for us to figure out what everybody did because Alan quit writing letters, or if he, he didn't quit writing them, but he told his family, I'm now on government contract, you can't publish my letters anymore. So we had to do some other research to sort of figure out what went on in 1854. The road at the end of 1853 was, as Alan said, most assuredly not sandpapered. And the next year he came back and he improved the road. Uh, that winter everybody spent in Olympia. And McClellan wrote a letter to his mom when he arrived in Olympia. This is what he said about Olympia wasn't really flattering. We have to pass the winter at Olympia on Puget Sound, a flourishing city of some 10 or 12 houses. <laughs> Fine prospect that. As there are no houses in Olympia that can be had, I expect to spend the winter in a tent labored by rain and mud. For if you must know, we don't expect to see the sun anymore until next summer. <laughs> Except at rare and short intervals of time, it's raining almost constantly. I don't think much of the Pacific Coast. It's surely vastly overrated in every respect. <laughs> now, he didn't have to spend the winter in a tent. He went over and found Alan's cabin on Bud Inlet, knocked on the door, and Alan said, yeah, you and George Gibbs, who had accompanied him, said, you can spend the winter in my cabin. Alan became his secretary, wrote the reports that McClellan was sending back to Washington, D.C., Gibbs was working on a dictionary, a Chinook jargon dictionary, and Gibbs's dictionary got published. Alan was doing one too. His has never been published. It still sits in his papers back in Pittsburgh, and it's bigger than uh, Gibbs's. Now, things weren't going to go so well for Mr. McClellan because Governor Stevens wanted Snoqualmie Pass explored from the West. And he told McClellan that you had to do this. Well, that prompted another letter to his mother. <laughs> this is what he wrote. In addition, I have to start again for the mountains as soon as we get to Olympia, a trip of three weeks in the rain and mud until we reach the mountains and then snow. As I never saw a snowshoe in my life except in a museum or a picture book, I don't anticipate much pleasure during the jaunt and I'm desirous of finishing it as soon as possible. He made it as far as this, Snoqualmie Falls. Encountered about six inches of snow, declared it impassable, <laughs> went back to Olympia and told Governor Stevens, you can't get through. Governor Stevens uh, kind of said, yeah. And then about two weeks later, a guy named Tinkham came through from the east over that pass that McClellan said, you couldn't do and told Governor Stevens, yeah, it was pretty easy. <laughs> Stevens fired McClellan at that point and sent him back to Washington, D.C. Now, you can see why I say if Abe Lincoln had this background, he would have not hired him. <laughs> okay, uh, the members of the Longmire Biles wagon train, the first to go over the new road in 1853, complained about how rough and sketchy the road was and about the difficulties they had traversing it, especially getting down that final steep cliff. A second party came over in November and they were less vocal. 
And Alan told him, he says, the road is most assuredly not sandpapered. But the next year, Winfield Eby came over, and this is what he wrote with his wagon train. Last year, the immigrants were compelled to let their wagons down by ropes or with large trees tied to them. Here we found that Mr. Allen had made a fine grade, so we descended quite easily. For about a half a mile, the road is cut into the side of the mountain, and on the lower side is a handrail for the whole distance. Guardrails on the road. After our book was published, Roger Blair, an Oregon California Trails Association member, located this photograph, which shows the actual logs that Allen cut and placed along the road to buttress it. So you can see they did quite some interesting projects. Allen was also a bit of a showman. Um, at the end, somebody also asked me about Allen and Mount Adams, but I can't talk about that right now. Um, this is Pyramid Peak, and what Allen did was, because that's a nice bear summit, he put a big American flag up there. And as the wagons came along here, where I'm standing taking the picture, and they look to their right as they're entering Puget Sound officially, there's this big American flag. And when they look to the left, what do they see? What mountain? Mount Rainier. It's quite a welcome to Puget Sound, especially if the sun's shining. So let's look at the road today as it goes through. The, well, first this. Um, the guys that went to work for Allen never got paid for the work they did before they went on government contract. Allen tried hard for years to get Congress to right that wrong, but it was never corrected. So the wagon road today, this is State Highway 168, still in the books, not finished, but it's a Jeep road today in excellent condition, as you can see, where it's level and dry. But where it's hilly, it's pretty eroded, like really eroded. And where it's muddy and wet, it looks like this. The Jeepers love it. The only section of the, uh, that's off limits for motorized vehicles is the cliff section. And this is me standing there in the part of the trail that they can't drive on. Now, I told you at the start there were some myths about this road and building it. The first one was, this is in almost every history book. It says the road workers quit early. And when the Longmire wagon train came over there, they were on their own. They, they, there was nobody to guide them. There was nothing there. And that's not true. What happened was the wagon train, when they reached the Columbia River, knew that they were going to run out of food before they got to the, you know, to the settlements. So they sent this guy, James Aiken, ahead. He found Allen's work crew at the Puyallup River, where they were building the trail in that section. Allen immediately sent Andy Burge with 300 pounds of flour up to the wagon train. And then he took Aiken back to the settlements and arranged for more food to start heading to the wagon train. Then he went to Stellicum and got more food for his workers. And they stayed in the field until about mid-October. So that one is just not true. The second one is even dumber. Um, the Andy Burge told the immigrants to go back as, because the way ahead was just not passable. Andy had been over that trail all summer, back and forth. He knew it was passable. And he also knew that the, the Longmire wagon train had come down the steepest part. And that there was a prairie just ahead called Bear Prairie where the animals could get feed. He may have told them to take a break before you continue, but he was not going to tell them, you know, turn around and go back. Why did he bring them 300 pounds of food, you know? Now, the one myth that just won't die is the kill another ox story. Anytime you read about Natchez Pass, this shows up. And this, basically the story is that when they reached this cliff at the kind of the bottom of the steep part of the hill, they had to kill three oxen and make rope out of their hides to lower the wagons down the cliff. And this one is everywhere. This is the sign that's at the top of the cliff. It's on that sign. There's a sign at the bottom of the cliff. It's on that sign. You pull, open a history book, and it will tell you about killing the three oxen. Uh, this story originated with George Himes, who was a nine-year-old kid in that wagon train at the time. 
And Himes and Ezra Meeker became good friends. And Ezra Meeker had an agenda. And he turned this story that he heard from Himes into this. Go around this hill they could not. Go down it with logs trailed by the wagons as they had done before. They could not. As the hill was so steep, the logs would go end over end and be a danger instead of a help. So the rope they had was run down the hill and was found to be too short to reach the bottom. One of the leaders of the party turned to his men and said, kill a steer. And they killed the steer and cut his hide into strips and spliced it into the rope. It was found yet to be too short to reach the bottom. The order went out, kill two more steers. And two more steers were killed. Their hides cut into strips and spliced into the rope, which then reached to the bottom of the hill. And by the aid of that rope and the strips of hides of those three steers, 29 wagons were lowered down the mountainside to the bottom of the steep hill. Only one broke away and it crashed down the mountain and was smashed into splinters. Okay, let's look at the geography. Okay, that's a cliff, I'll grant you. That is not where they went down. They went down over here. This was the total drop that they had to do but it's much more gentle this way. And you can see when they got down here, the grade eases considerably. This is at the top of the cliff, and you notice there are trees there. When Alan wrote about him working in this part of the trail, he said, we cleared out all the underbrush, but we left the big trees. So it would have been really easy to lower a wagon 50 feet, tie it off to one of the big trees, retrieve the rope, and continue on down those you know, short distance that they had to go. It was treed then, it's treed today. <laughs> I mean, you know. This is Ray Egan, and he's showing me how steep the trail was, which you can see isn't really that steep. And Ray has written extensively about the Kill an Ox story, and he has debunked it as well as it can be debunked. He is giving a lecture on Thursday at the Schmidt House at noon where he's going to talk about this. So if you want the whole story, you should show up there. And this is the sign that was at the bottom of the cliff. It since fell down. But it had the kill an ox in it. <laughs> so there's some problems with the kill an ox story. First of all, Van Ogle, who was an adult in this wagon train, said, it, we didn't do that. And George Himes, who eventually became the secretary of the Oregon Historical Society, said, yes, you did. And they got an argument that was fought out in the pages of the Pacific Northwest Quarterly. And Himes even went as far as to claim that he interviewed all sorts of people in that wagon train, and they all said they killed oxen. Well, Ray has gone through Himes' diaries and matched the dates when these interviews supposedly took place with where Himes was. The interviews did not happen. Himes wasn't telling the truth. Second. Ray has demonstrated that wagons carried tons of rope. It was one of the number one things that you made sure you went with. And third, Alan said, I left a rope at the top that reached to the bottom. And then this. You would think they all complained about how hungry they were. If they killed three oxen and, you know, you would have had a barbecue. And everybody would have been raving about the beefsteaks. Finally, not one mention from any person in that wagon train talks about eating beefsteaks. And lastly, the Tacoma Ledger, which was the newspaper back then, was sponsoring a contest for which pioneer could tell the best Oregon Trail story. The winner of that contest got a free trip to the Chicago World's Fair. No incentive to embellish your story at all, is there? So let's sum up a little bit. Two wagon trains actually went over the pass in 1853, the Longmire wagon train and uh, the Michael wagon train. Um, in 1854, four to six wagons went wagon trains went over the pass. But then the Indian War started, and it was primarily used by the combatants, Army and the Native Americans going back and forth. From 1860 to 1880, it was a stock trail used primarily by David Longmire, who lived over in the Weenus Valley, and he would bring his cattle over to sell in Puget Sound each spring, and so he knew the trail real well, and it stayed in pretty
pretty much in use through the 1880s. And today, as I said, it's a, a noted Jeep trail. Okay, now, as they mentioned earlier, we're selling books over there. My wife would be glad to help you. But before we get to that, do you, I have, somebody's got to ask me a couple questions that I ask you to do, okay? So the Longmire, is that the same person that settled over there um, in Longmire? By, by Mount Rainier? Yeah, it's the same guy. Yep. Okay, what were the questions? Tell me about Mount Adams. Mount Adams. <laughs> Alan took time out in 1854 from building that road to go with Andy Burge and Aiken, the guy who came to go climb Mount Adams. They are the first guys to ever go up Mount Adams. Okay, the other question was, how come it's not a state highway today? Well, what happened is Ezra Meeker lobbied long and hard to turn it into a state highway. I mean, he even ran for the state legislature on that issue. And he lost to the railroads. The railroads wanted to build a hotel at Sunrise. And they wanted a road that went close to the route up to Sunrise, which was Chinook Pass. Meeker said, if you build the road over Chinook Pass, it will be closed all winter. It will never be used for commercial traffic. And it will be incredibly dangerous because of avalanches. And he says, Natchez Pass is almost 2,000 feet lower. And if you build a tunnel through the, you know, the best part, it would be open all year. The hardest part, I mean, it would be open all year. And the railroads won except for the hotel. They never got the hotel built. Okay, any other questions? So how, how long is the, is the Jeep, like I'm wondering if what's hikeable up there. Um, you can hike from, from, the, from the bottom to the pass in a, in a day hike and come back down. My wife and I have done that. Uh -huh. And from the east side, you can hike from the bottom to the top and down in a day hike. It's about maybe eight miles at the most one way. I'd say more like six probably on each side. Okay. Well, if you can do that, is there any kind of map or guide that you would recommend? Yeah, on the internet, if you look, the, the Jeep road, the Jeepers have got a, a website devoted to that road. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So what, is, what pass does Highway 410 go through? 410 goes over Cayuse Pass and then Chinook Pass. Okay. So, uh, I, I guess, so there was just no push to build a road. I mean, I was living through the building of the North Cascades Highway, mm -hmm. which took forever. forever. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Uh, but Meeker fought long and hard to get the legislature to do this, but the railroad, their, their pockets were much deeper. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they contributed a lot of money to, you know, make sure that didn't happen because they wanted Chinook Pass. Mm -hmm. Did the uh, notes that, um, that McCollum and others took, they reference like the Indian trails that would have been used as a fuel to crack the over the passes? Um, they, they, when McClellan, you mean when he was up there exploring and stuff? Uh, um, there were Indian trails over both Snoqualmie Pass and Natchez Pass. The route from Vancouver Barracks up to the Natchez Pass area was pretty tough. It was hard to get through in those days. There was no trail. Alan just, I mean, McClellan just kind of bulldozed his way through. And when you get over to the east side, you're in open country, so it's easy to get around. Which tribes helped scout initially? It was in the Squalies. Uh, Quimuth and he, he went, some accounts say Quimuth actually went with Allen when they scouted it. And uh, other accounts say Leshi supplied the horses. Can you address whether uh, <coughs> the story that Governor Stevens was involved in the death of Quimuth? I just know the story, but I don't know the details that well. So I really can't, you know, weigh in on it that much. The guy who could probably help you there is Drew Cooks. Uh, he he's a local historian. He's really up on that. Yeah. And I would recommend the book uh, Peter Lars of 1903. Yeah. That's yeah, that's an excellent book about the whole story about Leshi and yeah. what happened. Okay. Where did the name Natchez come from? Uh, well, I think it's an Indian name, but I don't know for certain. Good question. Yeah. 
I've never found it. I've never looked it up. Yeah. Huh? There's a Natchez, Mississippi. Yeah, I know, but, but they pronounce it different. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I'd have to look that one up. I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. One question. You mentioned they brought cattle over there in yeah. 1880. Mm -hmm. My father told me, mentioned to me, that he would have heard a portion of the cross there which would have been around 1910 or 12. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because this Seattle Mountaineers, they did outings back in that time period in the Olympics and stuff, and they needed a lot of horses. And Longmire led a remuda of horses over for the Mountaineers just about every summer. Okay. All right, thank you.